the things that I'm going to be sharing with you tonight is in honor to one of these veterans. Even though he's gone to be with the Lord, he still remains a profound influence in my life and his influence remain indelible in my heart. And this is a tribute really, uh, if I would call it, to him even though he's not in the earth again. But I look at the extent of his impact even on this wise over my life. And I thought it was important to one more time acknowledge him and sincerely celebrate him. And then we go into our discussion. I'm talking about none other than Dr. Miles Munro. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was on a glorious morning on this very day I was in the city of Wari preaching at a conference when I woke up I think I woke up to pray early hours of the morning and then I was told that he had died in a plane crash and I said what happened why would such a great man die in a plane crash um, but then he died alongside his wife his assistant and I think their wives or so and um, it was quite an impactful loss if I would call it for the Bahamas Faith Ministry International but then he lives on today we have become extensions of his legacy I kept meditating even this morning on the many things I learned from him it was from this great man Dr. Miles that we learned the value and the excellency of purpose and that knowing your call and your assignment on time is an advantage to your life. It was from Dr. Miles Munro I learned, for instance, that leadership is not about looking for people to lead. It's a very poor idea of leadership. Unfortunately, that is largely the idea of leadership we have in Africa. Looking for people called followers, then we lead them. He taught us and mentored us into a superior understanding that leadership is about discovering, refining, and developing your giftings and potential and deploying them to serve so effectively that your influence and your impact becomes noticed by the people within your environment and they give you as a reward the gift of loyalty. This was his definition of leadership. That leadership is about deploying your giftings to serve, not looking for men to lead. Hallelujah. Profound contributions. It was from him I understood the kingdom. His book, Rediscovering the Kingdom, has remained a classic, bringing superior ideas, taking us beyond the shores of religion, and adding to our understanding. And today, by the grace of God, it is an honor to be making our own contribution to the body of Christ and even to this generation. We hope that someday if Christ tarries, someone will be able to point to our lives too and say we live meaningful lives. I hope that will be true for you. <laughs> Anytime I talk about things that relate to death, everybody keeps quiet. Why are you afraid of dying? You will not die. I've told you this. Hallelujah. I'm sure someone is saying, no, I've not built, I've not married, no way. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> So God bless Dr. Miles Munro. God bless his works. God bless his legacy in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lamentations 10:27. I'm teaching tonight on maximizing destiny. Maximizing destiny. You will want to listen to the things that I'm teaching. And the credit for these thoughts are directly connected to this great man. Uh, quite directly connected to him. Um, I have done very little editing as far as the knowledge that I've received on this wise. He helped me understand the concept of destiny so thoroughly. And there are a few questions we are going to ask and hopefully answer tonight. And I guarantee you by the integrity of scripture that the answers to this question will be for you a compass to a new horizon in destiny. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lamentations 10:27. Media, are we together? Lamentations. Is it 10 or 327? Did I miss that? 
it is good that a man bear his yoke in his youth if i omit any scripture help me thank you sometimes um we just keep the verses or we interchange them it is good the bible says for a man that he bear his yoke in his youth this immediately suggests to us that timing matters in the kingdom hallelujah that not every time is convenient for everything second scripture ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 remember now it says thy creator in the days of thy youth while the evil days come not nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say i have no pleasure in them the bible is charging us to remember the creator that you must walk with this understanding and this and with this awareness that god exists and that the reason why you exist is because he is there and that there is a mandate upon your life our precious worship people just sang and stared us into understanding that there's prophecy upon our lives and it's important not just to sing it but we must have a profound understanding now many people live lives that are empty and void of meaning lives full of identity crisis lives of purposelessness lives without meaning the average person who is walking gallivanting the earth today cannot clearly articulate why they are here hallelujah for many people they just live to exist so the trajectory for the average unenlightened person is to be born find yourself growing if you are fortunate you attend a secular system of education eventually you transit from childhood to teenage adolescence become an adult then hopefully marry have a family and then struggle your way and then at the end of your life if you are fortunate to have good children and grandchildren lucky for you if it's unfortunate for you you join you join the bandwagon of people regretting their lives and then you die most likely of some terrible ailment or some misuse of your body and your life and your times do you think that is a worthy template that is not an effective template for living and yet many people today keep following that road and you would think because others have gone ahead making the same mistakes those who are coming would see notice and correct it and yet it continues to be the same mistake from person to person this is true for africans true for europeans true for people down west and tonight god wants to help us understand that destiny and life is a gift a gift that can be abused but a gift that can be maximized the intent for this teaching is that in the nearest future not just at the end of your life that within the nearest future you can look back and see that you have repositioned your life and you are maximizing destiny one of the factors that is responsible for joy and happiness even from a secular standpoint is progress we feel happy and we feel fulfilled to the degree to which we feel we are making constructive progress it is the reason why people frown at things like delay they frown at things like stagnation if you're a man of god for instance and you begin a ministry and after three four five years the ministry is not growing not just numerically in terms of impact in terms of membership finances your influence it becomes a source of concern even biologically when a woman gives birth to a child you expect that after two three four years the child would grow the child will be able to speak the child will be able to do things by himself or herself and if that child becomes incapacitated after two three four years it becomes a matter of concern and the parents now start focusing on seeing how they can get medical or spiritual help so god designed men to grow god designed men to advance god designed men to excel are we together to excel in every ramification the bible says in luke 2 52 and jesus increased in wisdom he increased in stature he increased in favor with god and with men nobody wants to remain stagnated indefinitely in life and destiny 
as a man of God, I am happy and encouraged. Even though I love the Lord sincerely, even beyond the results. But I am encouraged that whilst I am teaching, week in, week out, there are faithful people who are coming to listen. And that the ministry is growing in leap and bounds. If that is true for me, it means it should be true for anyone and everyone. Hallelujah. And I'm praying for you in the name of Jesus Christ that everything that has stunted your growth, that you will not move forward, you will not go forward, and people look at your life and say, what is wrong with you? It looks like you are not making advancement. You are 40, you are still with your parents. 50, you are still with your parents. With your wife and children, but you are still begging from your parents. May that cause come to an end now. Shout a loud Amen. In Matthew chapter 16 from verse 13, Jesus asked a very profound question. And this was a question that led to the revelation of the church. The word church was first mentioned in this discourse. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, the Bible says, he asked his disciples saying, Who do men say? Listen carefully. Not who do angels say? Not who do demons say? Who do men say that I the son of man am? This is a question probing into an understanding of identity. This teaching tonight captures three areas. One, identity. Two, purpose. Three, meaning. The jurisdiction of tonight's teaching is to bring enlightenment across these three areas. Number one, again, identity. Number two, purpose. Number three, meaning. Verse 14. They said, some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah or Elias. Some say you are Jeremiah or even one of the prophets. Next verse, he says, But whom say ye that I am? And like I've taught here many times, they were shocked to know that even though they were in close proximity with Jesus, they really did not know who he was. Next verse. And Peter spoke by the Spirit and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. I know your identity. I'm walking with you, but I am not confused. You are not one of those prophets. Those prophets came because you are here. Those prophets excel because you are here. You are not just joining the queue. You are God himself, Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, and he says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Dr. Miles Munro taught very profoundly. And I'm grateful to God that when he taught, some of us listened. There were people who heard but did not listen. There were others who did not even care to listen. They were busy trying to figure their way out through life. Recall my teaching last week. The truth is that the easiest way to make constructive progress in life, I taught you last week, is when you partner with models. Models who have been able to pay the price to find the way for you. Eventually, you may find other paths they have not found. But you will have to leverage on the advantage of their presence, their knowledge, their experience to prime your advancement first. Ignoring every resource available for you, both human and material and spiritual, in a quest to becoming, in a quest to making it, will only leave you in defeat, in shame, and disappointment. And so Dr. Munro said very profoundly that in his opinion, and I agree with him till date, that there were certain questions that every man would have to ask and answer if they desired destiny maximization. It was... Dr. Mike Mudok, who said, a question is the seed for an answer. That means the difference between a madman talking, speaking gibberish, is that he's not answering, he's just speaking. Are we together now? An answer is a response, not just talking, not just discussion. So when you want an answer, the seed that you sow for the harvest of an answer is a question. And I want to challenge you the same way God used Dr. Miles to challenge me, what you call Koinonia Global today, and by the privilege of God's grace, if there is anything good that has come out of this life that is speaking to you, I credit it 
to the ability to answer to know and to walk with these questions they have remained pillars during my retreat i probe myself again along these questions and if for any reason i have difficulty answering any of them that becomes my next project are you ready there are five questions he taught us that every man must be able to ask to live an effective life and to actualize destiny don't assume don't pretend you know if you have gotten these questions and your answers are right your destiny should be speaking now if for any reason even if you believe that you have got some knowledge of this perhaps from his materials once your knowledge has not produced results keep listening and keep learning it means there is something wrong with your understanding because faith has two layers one is awareness the second is comprehension faith cometh by hearing and hearing the first hearing is unto awareness the second hearing is unto comprehension or understanding you're still with me shout amen, amen. the first question that we are going to be asking and answering tonight is a question of identity is a question who am i please write it down who am i is a profound question that attempts to bring to your consciousness the concept and the value of identity psychologists and religious leaders and even scientists agree at this point that an individual who does not know himself or herself is already on the path to doom and the path to defeat there are many people today who are under the pressure to become several things depending on who is putting the pressure on them hallelujah and it is simply because they have not taken out time to study their identity identity is a very powerful thing it's a very profound thing sadly our world is gradually losing the sense of identity and it's resulting to all kinds of pressure people trying to show that they are making it preachers not being patient with process until they become business people leaders and so on and so forth identity crisis is a dangerous psychological cancer it can destroy a great destiny it is important that from the onset these are not questions you should ask at the end of your life these are the questions that guarantee you're reaching the end successfully are we together now there are certain questions you have the liberty of asking as you go but these are questions that are best answered before the journey or at the infancy of the journey so that if you have to turn back you would not have wasted years before making a u-turn are we learning now the thing about the school of the spirit and the school of destiny is that even if you are in error moving in the wrong direction for 20 years by the time you find the right path God will mandate that you return back and start the journey afresh. You would think you would just shift to a new lane. It doesn't work like that in the spirit. Hallelujah. Imagine spending 10, 15 years of your life following a path that seemed right unto you only to find out that it's a way of destruction, it's a way of failure and then you have to make that you turn again. The same distance you wasted arriving at your place of error is the same distance you will spend to come back to the point where you will start again. I'm praying that you will pay attention to the things that you are hearing so that you will not have to answer this question when your children are answering their own. Did you hear what I said? There are many people who will refuse to answer this question and they will be forced to repeat the classes in the school of the spirit and now answer this question together with their children or answer this question together with their grandchildren and life has no respect for time that was ill invested if you did not invest in your time to maximize moments you your children will join you in the school of the spirit your grandchildren will join you in the school of the spirit and they will ask you why are you answering this question at this point the question of identity psalm 49 and verse 20. the bible says a man that is in honor and understandeth it not is like a beast in the field that perisheth 
Do you know what that means? Assuming you are royalty, for instance, maybe you came from a royal family, but you were never told for whatever reason. You will act like a slave and even be victimized by people who you were supposed to be higher than in terms of the privilege that you have. Many believers, because they do not understand their identity, they go through all kinds of psychological swings trying to become the kind of person who will gain an applause from people. Let me tell you this. One of the cardinal pillars for effective leadership and becoming an influence is having a strong conviction of your identity. Because as you sojourn through life and destiny, hear me ladies and gentlemen, culture will try to redefine you. The failure of people will try to redefine you. The thinking of the time will try to redefine you. For instance, in our world right now, when you see a young man and perhaps pressing honorably to his life and destiny, chances are excellent that he will feel like a failure because he does not have a car, he does not have maybe some house, and so on and so forth. And there are many people who are actually doing well, but simply because society has given a wrong parameter to measure masculinity, a wrong parameter to measure growth, a wrong parameter to measure ministry, a wrong parameter to measure success. The fake life that is eating up the average young man in our society is credited directly to identity crisis. Hallelujah. So even if I'm a dummy, once I am in a car and I'm driving it, I immediately have a sense of superiority to everybody thinking. That is the reason why many young people today have found themselves in all kinds of destructive vices. Almost every week, the law enforcement agents are apprehending someone who is involved in some kind of shady practice, some kind of destructive practice. And you ask the young man, what exactly are you looking for? The cliche in our world today is, I want to make it. Who is the I? That is the question we want to ask. Who is the I who wants to make it? Society has told us that we are failures when certain things does not happen, when certain things does not add up. Are we together? And some of you right now in this place, you are, you literally, you would have been better by far if you had that sense of self-security for want of word upon the strength of who God has made you. Some gentleman looked at you and said you are not a beautiful lady and that destroyed your sense of self-worth and you started acting and doing things, even stupid things because you are trying to fit. There is a cancer that is eating up young people in our world today is the pressure to belong. Have you heard such a statement? So they create mundane parameters that you must qualify to join certain groups or certain people and they are not all wrong, but there are some that are so destructive. There are groups and people today that if you are a sound Christian and you love the Lord, living a responsible life as a young man and a young lady, those groups will send you away. They will say you are too innocent to be part of them. They want bad people. It's, it's like a credit. If you say you are a well-behaved person, they say, no, you are too naive and you are too stupid to work with us. We need people who are prone to destruction, prone to anger, prone to rebellion. Are we together? Someone who can beat anyone once you are angry. And then they call it all kinds of names. And some of us who were once well-behaved are now becoming something that we were not designed by God because of the pressure to belong. Dressing speaking social media there are people who were dressing well until they met certain groups of people and they told them if you keep dressing like this you will not marry now that you have changed what has happened <laughs> say deception yeah. the basic definition of witchcraft is to cause someone to err using the tool of deception hallelujah how about young men with the value of respect and dignity and honor. But then here comes a group of very confused but arrogant people who now begin to put pressure on your identity. And they say, Mr. Man, at the rate at which you are going, you will never get established. There is a way we do things. And after two years of foolish work, you find yourself in the prison.
perhaps for the next 10 years, perhaps for the next 15 years. And the thing is that when you get into trouble, all the people who motivated you into that trouble will not come and own up and say, we are here for you. Hmm. Who am I? It's a question that I had to answer in my life. If you know who you are, you will reject the pressure from men to become anything God did not say about you. Hallelujah. For instance, I learned from this revelation that having a car and having a house is not what defines me. I'm not saying those things are wrong. But if I suddenly feel good about my life just when I have a car and a house, it's a risk. What then happens when the car spoils? Your value for yourself also drops. So if I stand in the midst of someone who has a better dressing than me, I begin to feel like a failure. By what parameter? Who brought these parameters? It's time for you to begin to probe the things that represent the epicenter of your self-worth. Now, I'm not saying to not be challenged. Because there are some of us who really need to be challenged. If people don't challenge you, you will never leave that psychological cocoon that you are in. So, being challenged is a good thing for many people. Hallelujah. Yes. There are people today, for instance, who are not earning up to, say, 100000 a month. But every great hotel, maybe in this city or restaurant, you will find them there. You are here again, say yes. <laughs> who is paying for this? No, by myself. 20000 out of a salary of 100000 You didn't tithe, you didn't give, you didn't save, you didn't do anything. And then, while the food is there, you now take um, this thing you put take. And then you send it and say, look, maybe God is good or to God be the glory. And then the people you hope to see, as always, you know I'm not being sarcastic, I'm probing you. What you see today that you call koinonia, ladies and gentlemen, is not just a journey of faith alone. It's a journey of patience. Life challenged our identity in various ways. But thanks be to God for the resilience to remain. When you find out what God has said about you, it doesn't matter who misunderstands. Or do, Many of us today want great organizations. You want to lead ministries. You want to lead businesses. And someone says stupid and you are crying. Am I, is this how I am? You mean this sister just looks at me and says, but the question is, are you stupid? Has the word of God ever told you you are stupid? Those who mentor and lead you, have they ever told you you are stupid? So someone who has no investment whatsoever in your life wants to come and stake, claim a stake in your mind and you give them permission, you give them entrance into your mind. Before I listen to you, I must see the contribution you have made to my destiny. You don't come as a stranger and want the seat of somebody who has made meaningful investments. Is someone learning now? So you must know how to edit opinions and throw rubbish to the to the bin and keep moving. Someone looks at you and says, you look like you are not a powerful Christian. From you, I, I suspect that I said, this lady, you will most likely not be a great lady. Congratulations for your ignorance. Watch as you learn and ask God for forgiveness for the remaining part of your life. Because as for me, I'm evolving. Because like our people sang, the word of God is with me. The Holy Spirit is with me. God has placed models before me and a determination to succeed. No, there is no power in existence that sustains what it takes to keep you down. Are we together?